Okay, I believe we're ready to begin. Let's uh, bow our heads for prayer. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, as we again take up this question or this topic of the Godhead and the Trinity and the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we acknowledge our inability to explain this fully in human terms. We ask that your spirit would draw near to us and give us understanding and help us to realize that we are, we're only approximating what, what we think makes sense of what you have revealed. We cannot fully comprehend you. Lord, you also know that we have many other things on our minds besides you, even though we want you to be our highest priority. <clears throat> so I pray that you would be with each one here today, with the families that are represented here, and give each one the assurance that in you uh, we are able to do what you've called us to do. Paul asked the question in 2 Corinthians 2, who is sufficient for these things? And a few verses later he says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves for anything, but our sufficiency is from God. And then he goes on to say, who also makes us sufficient for the work he's committed to us. And we praise you for that, Lord. We thank you that you died for our sins and that you are with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, yesterday we basically did a brief overview of some of the main biblical evidence for one God in three personalities, or three persons. And then we traced how Adventists came to this conclusion. Um, several of the Adventist leaders were uh, coming from an anti-Trinitarian background, and this was... Uh, an issue that was not uh, uh, agreed on uh, from a Trinitarian point of view. But gradually over the years as they studied and as Alan White had visions that revealed facets of God's character and his work, um, they began to have doubts whether, whether <clears throat> the non-Trinitarian position, which basically saw God as the, as the one who was eternal, and Christ is coming forth from God sometime later um, and not sure whether the Holy Spirit was a person at all, um, there began to be increasing doubts about whether this really adequately described the reality of the scriptural evidence. And so I'm backing up just a couple of slides here to overlap with what we did yesterday. In 1888, we had the famous conference on righteousness by faith. And the uh, leading speaker there was E.J. Wagner. And his studies on righteousness by faith led him to see that the basis of Christ's power to redeem is his eternal equality with God the Father. He is able to redeem us because he is God. And he did not begin his existence on this earth, but he pre-existed from eternity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And Wagner urged the necessity to set forth Christ's rightful position of equality with the Father in order that his power to redeem may be better appreciated. And at this point, he was not yet fully Trinitarian in his views, but he saw that there's a correspondence between the justifier and the justified. And if the justifier is himself God, then he is able to justify us to perfection. If the justifier is something less than God, then when he goes before the Father, he has to ask a favor. God, will you please save these people? But when he goes before the Father as God, as, and when Jesus Christ as God meets with the Father as God, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, make a request. Um, he doesn't plead in the sense of a beggar for our salvation. 
but he pleads like a lawyer in court. We hear in scripture, we, we read in scripture that Jesus pleads before the Father, pleads his blood on our behalf. Now there are different kinds of pleading. There's a pleading like a beggar who asks for something that is beyond his power and, uh, and hopes for a favor. But there's also the pleading that an attorney does in court. And Jesus pleads before the Father as one equal with the Father. And the plea that he enters in is that we have been redeemed through his sacrifice. He and the Father agreed on this from the beginning. He has carried it out. And now, as the equal of the Father, he is presenting what he has done with the claim that we are now entitled to his righteousness. And so he brings an authority to this pleading that is not there if he is less, less than equal with the Father. Well, this, came to, this uh, paradigm shift uh, came to a point in 1898 with the publication of Desire of Ages. And actually there was a, a, another publication in 1897 that put forth some of this, and we'll look at this. And we looked briefly yesterday at, uh, well, I guess we just began this part yesterday. In the Desire of Ages, on the first page of the first chapter, she affirmed, from the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. In the chapter on the raising of Lazarus, in which Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, Ellen White commented, in Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. If Christ is not divine, we have no assurance. But he is. Regarding Christ's own resurrection, she declared the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. He was not dependent on the Father for his life. He came forth from the li by the life that was in himself. And, um, and she talks about how the angel came to the tomb and said, uh, Jesus Christ, come forth, thy Father calls thee. And she says the, the father calling was, was the father's acknowledgement that his sacrifice had been complete, that the atonement had been perfect, that the price for our salvation was paid. And so he certifies that to Jesus. But Jesus comes forth from the life that is in himself. His human nature had died, but not his divinity. The book also included clear statements about the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. And now uh, this, this book, Desire of Ages, was a bit of a bombshell in the denomination because many were considered themselves non-Trinitarian and did not see it quite this way. And there was some... Uh, some discussion, what's, what's this, that Ellen White is bringing us something new. Um, M. L. Andreasen was a new Adventist at that time, a relatively new Adventist. Uh, he was baptized at 18 uh, after Bible studies with, with a woman Bible worker, and uh, she did a very thorough job. And he was baptized at 18, and shortly after that ended the ministry, and then uh, selected as his life companion, the Bible worker that had uh, baptized him, <laughs> that had, uh, that had uh, given him Bible studies. So they were a team. Anyway, he was concerned about this and he couldn't really believe it. He said, there's something wrong here. I think somebody is, somebody's interfering because this isn't, this isn't in harmony with what Ellen White wrote before. And so he traveled to Elmshaven where she was living at that time. This was about 1900. 19, 1901, 1902, something like that. And she had a fairly big house there and about a dozen people that lived with her, um, various kinds of uh, helpers. And um, so she invited him to stay and he stayed for several weeks. And she opened to him um, the handwritten manuscripts from Desire of Ages. And he read it in her own handwriting. And uh, so then he knew, 
He said, I, I cannot doubt that uh, this is what she believes and this is what she wrote and that this is from her. And uh, so he spent some time there with her, just getting his feet on the ground as a, as a new Adventist and as a young minister. Well, what we discover as we examine her role in the change was that she was not an anti-Trinitarian who suddenly out of the blue dropped a bombshell and said, we've been wrong, it's the Trinity. Her writings about the Godhead show a clear progression, a gradual progression, not from anti-Trinitarianism to pro-Trinitarianism, but from relative ambiguity to, to a greater specificity. Now by that I mean, um, at the beginning she didn't make any blanket statements about the Godhead or the Trinity or anything like that. She just took what was in Scripture, um, what she had studied, um, and what others had studied and so forth. But, and so some of her early statements seem a little unsure. And that's because she wasn't yet sure. She didn't yet know for sure. And uh, her change of view was a matter of growth and progression, not reversal. Unlike her husband, she never directly attacked the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, James White had done that um, about the same year that they were married. But Ellen White never made any negative statements about the doctrine of the Trinity. But here are some of the stages in the transition. Um, from the beginning of her ministry, she portrayed God as a personal, literal, tangible being. This was in direct opposition to some who viewed God as distant, impersonal, mystical, and ultimately unreal. In one of her early visions in 1845, she said, I saw a throne, and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself. He said he had but I could not behold it. For, said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Later she wrote, I've often seen the lovely Jesus, that he is a person. I asked him if his father was a person and had a form like himself. Said Jesus, I am in the express image of my father's person. So Jesus basically responds in this conversation they're having in vision, uh, Jesus responds by quoting Hebrews 1 uh, about Jesus being the express image of the Father. In Spiritual Gifts, 1858, this was her first telling of the Conflict of the Ages story. It's 219 very small pages, not much bigger than a 3 by 5 card. And in the first three chapters, the fall of Satan, the fall of man, and the plan of salvation, she mentions only the Father and the Son in dealing with Lucifer and the fall of Adam and Eve. Not till page 28, and you can tell how short the book is by the fact that she went from creation to the baptism of Jesus in 28 pages. Um, in the narrative of Jesus' baptism, she brings in all the persons of the Godhead. And then in 1869, she writes that Jesus was equal with God. And in 1877, the Son of God was in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In 1887, she wrote a letter to E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones, who were, this was just before, just before the great conference on righteousness by faith. And she said in this letter, she said, As Jesus passed to and fro among the subjects he came to save, scarcely a solitary voice called him blessed. Scarcely a solitary hand was stretched out in friendship. Scarcely a solitary roof proffered him shelter. Then look beneath the disguise. And whom do we see? Divinity, the eternal Son of God, just as mighty as the Father, just as infinitely gifted with all the resources of power. And he was found in fashion as a man. So even though Jesus took on human form, he was nonetheless God. And she went on to say, in uh, a year later, this is in the 1888 Great Controversy, if men reject the testimony of the inspired scriptures concerning the divinity of Christ, 
It is in vain to argue the point with them, for no argument, however conclusive, could convince them. None who hold this error can have a true conception of the character or the mission of Christ or of the great plan of God for man's redemption. So it's intrinsic to Jesus' work in our salvation that he is deity, he is God, and existed pre... He existed to eternity, as mind-boggling as that is for us humans. Before the entrance of evil, Christ the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, and in purpose, the only being in all the universe that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. By Christ the Father wrought in the creation of all heavenly beings, and to Christ, equally with the Father, all heaven gave allegiance. Then in 1890, she published Patriarchs and Prophets. And this was a revision and enlargement of her previous books on spiritual gifts and spirit of prophecy, um, the volume on the Old Testament. And so some of this material she had written many years before. And she wrote again, The Son of God shared the Father's throne and the glory of the eternal, self-existent one encircled both. Later in the book, she identifies Christ as the great I Am who spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai, the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Now, she did not at first recognize God's Trinitarian nature, but when she did, um, she first wrote of it in 1897. She described the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as real individuals. She emphasized their threeness as willing, thinking, social, and relational persons, and explained their oneness in terms of nature, character, purpose, and love, but not in terms of being only one person. <clears throat> Here's the quotation from Special Testimony Series A, number 10, Page 25 from 1897. This is uh, one year before Desire of Ages, and some of this material was, was included in Desire of Ages. Evil had been accumulating for centuries and could only be restrained and resisted by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. And then 1898 in Desire of Ages. She uh, made this, this statement, uh, in Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. And this statement, more than any other, turned the tide of shifting the, the paradigm among Adventists. It wasn't that they simply took Ellen White's word for it, but she backed it up with scripture, and as they studied the scriptures, they became convinced that she was indeed calling their attention to truth. In her writings about the Godhead, one can observe a clear progression from the simple to the complex, suggesting that Ellen White's understanding did grow and change as she received additional light. You know, her first, her first report of her first vision was given in person to a fairly small group of Adventists. And at that point, she had the same knowledge that they had from her background in a Christian church and from her shared experience in the Millerite movement, they shared uh, a number of beliefs because of that. But she had only had one vision and she spoke on the basis of that one vision. But by 1898, she had had many, many, many visions. And as she accumulates additional knowledge through visions, it gives her greater insight into scripture and uh, all kinds of things. So um, one of the things that, that some of the Adventists, anti-Trinitarians cling to is that Ellen White did not change. And therefore, if she wrote something in 1850 that sounds a little bit non-Trinitarian, then she had to believe she was, she had to remain a non-Trinitarian all her life. And that just is not according to the evidence. If you want to think of some other ways in which Ellen White changed, um, when she had her first vision, she was a Sunday keeper, 
she was eating pork and uh, had no knowledge of a number of things that we consider crucial beliefs today. It was almost 20 years, it was 19 years later that she had her first vision that said we should not eat pork and uh, that we should start moving toward getting along with, without any meat at all because because uh, the disease in animals is, is getting worse and worse. And uh, she rebuked S.N. Haskell in the 1860s for campaigning on the idea that Adventists should not eat pork. And she said, if God wants us to give up pork, he'll make it known to more than one person. And, uh, and he did, but it was about six years later after that even. So, so she changed on her understanding of the Sabbath, on her understanding of health reform, on her understanding of many things. And this is not, this is not a problem. This is just the way it works. In the Kellogg crisis, the Trinity uh, came up again. Um, Kellogg theorized that the life of every living thing, whether tree, flower, animal, or human, was the very presence of God within it. And his, his idea was that every living person has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Um, and Ellen White disagreed with this. She said, no, the Holy Spirit dwells in those who have accepted Christ as their Savior. The Holy Spirit works from the outside on all of us and he works he works inwardly also but he does not dwell in those who have not especially uh, accepted him and um, so the life of a non-christian is not the presence of God it is the power of God but not the presence of God and um, El uh, Kellogg said that that everything in nature equals the presence of God. He taught that God dwells intrinsically in all life forms, that God's power equals his presence. And then he claimed that Ellen White agreed with his view. And Ellen White wrote a letter to the teachers at Emanuel Missionary College, forerunner of Andrews University. And uh, she says, I have something to say to our teachers in reference to the new book, The Living Temple. Be careful how you sustain the sentiments of this book regarding the personality of God. As the Lord represents matters to me, these sentiments do not bear the endorsement of God. They are a snare that the enemy has prepared for these last days. I thought that this would surely be discerned and it would not be necessary for me to say anything about it. There may be in this book, The Living Temple, expressions and sentiments that are in harmony with my writings. And there may be in my writings many statements which, when taken from their connection and interpreted according to the mind of the writer of Living Temple, would seem to be in harmony with the teachings of this book. This may give apparent support to the assertion that the sentiments in Living Temple are in harmony with my writings. But God forbid that this opinion should prevail. This is not right. She says, the new theories in regard to God and Christ as brought out in the Living Temple are not in harmony with the teaching of Christ. The Lord Jesus came to this world to represent the Father. He did not represent God as an essence pervading nature, but as a personal being. Christians should bear in mind that God has a personality as verily as has Christ. This pamphlet offers perhaps the most radical indictment she ever wrote against a false view of the Trinity, followed by one of her most explicit definitions of what she considered to be the true understanding of the Godhead. And here is what she want, goes on to say, what she explains as the truth uh, in contrast to the error. She said, the sentiments of those who are searching for advanced scientific ideas are not to be trusted. Such representations as the following are made. The Father is as the light invisible. The Son is as the light embodied. The Spirit is the light shed abroad. So comparing the Trinity to light. Another one was that the Father is like the dew, invisible vapor. The Son is like the dew gathered in beauteous form. The Spirit is like the dew fallen to the seed of life. 
Another representation, the Father is like the invisible vapor, the Son is like the leaden cloud, the Spirit is rain, fallen and working in refreshing power. And then she said, all these spiritualistic representations are simply nothingness. They are imperfect, untrue. They weaken and diminish the majesty which no earthly likeness can be compared to. God cannot be compared with the things his hands have made. These are mere earthly things, suffering under the curse of God because of the sins of man. The Father cannot be described by the things of earth. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. So there's, there's her brief statement about the Father. Then she goes on to say the Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested, that is made visible. The Word of God declares, declares Him to be the express image of His person. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the fact that God loved the world, in John 3.16, is shown the personality of the Father. He is not a, an impersonal force pervading nature. He is a personality who so loved the world that He gave His Son. And then she goes on to say that the Comforter that Christ promised to send after He ascended to heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest, that is making visible, the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. And then she summarizes, there are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized. And these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Yes? Um, I have a question about uh, the roles within the, 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 the Trinity. Uh, for example, because we have a text um, like for example, you know, we know it is it is not the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us in the most holy place. It is Jesus. Um, you know, uh, Hebrews talks about that Christ offered Himself unto God, mm -hmm. um, and it talks about God, uh, not the Spirit sending Jesus. Jesus says that we need to pray to the Father in His name, etc., etc., and other texts. Um, because sometimes, uh, like for example, like we, I have heard. Uh, some brothers and sisters praying to like praying to the Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> do you feel that you know that's correct? Do, do, do you feel that um, we can kind of just uh, interchange? Is that interchanging their roles? Because you know we, we don't have you know Christ didn't pray to the Spirit when He was here on Earth. He's prayed He prayed to the Father. Um, does that matter? Uh, are those distinctions and roles? important or is there a danger to blurring uh, those specific roles? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. And it's a, it's a big question. I'll try to address it briefly. Um, <clears throat> my understanding, and this is just my personal opinion, I could be wrong, but when Jesus told his disciples just before he was crucified, if you pray to the Father in my name, the Father will give you what you need. Um, he was putting it in those terms because they knew him and they, they knew Christ and they trusted him and they had lived with him and, and so they knew who he was. And God seemed far distant. They didn't really feel like they knew God. And so one of Jesus' burdens that last night before he was crucified was, was uh, to tell them that you can pray to the Father in my name and in my name, you can, you can go to the Father. And He will give, you, give to you just like He would to me. In other words, I pray to the Father, and He gives me what I need. You can pray to the Father in my name, and the Father will treat you just the way He treats me. He will give you what you ask in my name. So he, Jesus is, is giving them uh, an ID card or, or something like that, that they can present. And, and they will be received just as if it were Jesus Himself. And, uh, but then he adds, but it's not because the Father doesn't love you. The Father himself loves you. That's why he sent me into the world. So he's, tr he's getting them to transition 
He's helping them to see that God the Father loves them just as much as he does. And, and the, the Holy Spirit, uh, in the passage in, uh, in Acts 5, where Peter says to, Anna, to Ananias, uh, what put in your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. Um, it clearly shows that the Holy Spirit can be spoken to. And, and I tend to think that some of the distinctions are based on um, the fact that they had believed in one God, now they, were, they had come to believe in the Messiah, and now they were believing the Messiah was really God in the beginning, and that he had been God with the Father before he became the Messiah, and now we have two personalities, and when they could get their minds around that, then they were prepared to recognize a third personality in the Holy Spirit. I think it's important that we recognize the differences in their work, that the Father, um, the Father is the sort of the figurehead or something, and that, that Jesus is the one who volunteered to be the sacrifice and the Holy Spirit. While Jesus intercedes with the Father, the Holy Spirit intercedes with us. In, in Romans 8, or yeah, Romans 8, about 20, 22, 26, somewhere in there, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's where I was wondering, um, like you said, we're supposed to pray to God in the name of Jesus and stuff, but I thought the work of the, that the Holy Spirit is just to convict them. We're not supposed to necessarily pray to the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, well, that that, <clears throat> or in your opinion, of course, yeah, I, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to do a study of this, to look through the scripture and see um, what, what evidence there is in the New Testament. Um, I have, have had the general understanding that, that once we understand that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are perfectly united in their purposes, in their understanding, they have no differences of opinion. They have no disagreements. Their attitude toward us and their love toward us is the same. And, uh, and so it really, if we pray to God in Jesus' name, uh, the Holy Spirit will do what we ask. Um, so when the disciples prayed to Jesus, the Holy Spirit did what they asked, or Jesus did what they asked. And, and I think that that it's not such a clear distinction when we know that they are, th they are all three, one, and pre-existent from the beginning. So, but I have no desire to, to uh, push anybody to a form of particular form of prayer. And there are complications to this. For instance, when we're working with Muslims, um, Muslims are very keen on the Father being the only God and uh, they also recognize there is the Word of God and there is the Spirit of God, but, um, but I've heard of Muslims confronting an Adventist minister and saying, do you pray directly to Jesus as God or do you pray to the Father in Jesus' name? And, and for Muslims to pray to the Father in Jesus' name is okay because they recognize the New Testament is also scripture. Um, not equal to the Quran, but still a holy writing. And so they're not offended by that. But when, when you speak about praying directly to Jesus, then you've gone beyond the normal Muslim understanding. Um, that's more of a Christian understanding, that Jesus is equal with the Father. And, um, and uh, there are some Christians that, that feel very strongly that it's extremely important to pray to the Father in Jesus' name, not to pray to Jesus. I'm sure you know people. Uh, I have a, a dear friend who is about 50 years old, and uh, he still prays the way he was taught to pray when he was a little boy. I mean, his prayers, are, his prayers are mature, but he still starts out, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. And I remember when I prayed, Dear Jesus, but then I eventually got taught that I'm supposed to address the Father in Jesus' name, and so forth. But uh, the fact is that when we cry out to God in a sense of deep need, God hears our prayers. Amen. Whatever you call him, 
however you address him, if you come in humility and in recognition of your need and recognition that he is God, he will respond. And uh, so I guess that's my thought. Okay, now those were all, those were all in uh, 1905, the last ones I read. Now in 1906, she uh, writes similarly. And uh, before men or angels were created, the Word was with God and was God. The world was made by Him. If Christ made all things, He existed before all things. The words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one need to be left in doubt. God was, Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. He was with God from all eternity, God over all, blessed forevermore. So she's basically piling together her adjectives and nouns here to convince you that she is using the strongest language she knows to, to assert that Jesus existed from eternity. He did not come into existence. He became the Son at a certain point in the plan of salvation, but he existed with the Father for all eternity, is, is what I make of, of the statements. The Lord Jesus, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. He was the surpassing glory of heaven. He was the commander of the heavenly intelligences, and the adoring homage of the angels was received by him as his right. So summary, she very early rejected the views that God is formless, intangible, impersonal, as implied by some of the Trinitarian creeds, or that he's simply a force in nature as portrayed in the living temple. She called these things spiritualistic theories. But over years of time, through many visions, she gradually came to understand the Godhead as three divine personalities who are one in nature, character, purpose, and love. Thus she accepted a literal biblical view of one God in three persons, though she never used the word Trinity. Now my opinion is that why she didn't use the word Trinity is that an uncritical use of the word Trinity could have led others to accept concepts that she rejected. There were things attached to the traditional concept of the Trinity that, that were not biblical. By not using the term, she left it for others to investigate and decide for themselves. To what extent the term accurately represents their real belief. To what extent it carries unacceptable baggage. And, and uh, an example is the meaning to Muslims of the term Christian. Uh, I've heard of missionaries who were getting acquainted with Muslims and they would say, are you a Christian? And the missionary, instead of giving a direct answer, said, well, what do you understand a Christian to be? And they said, oh, a Christian is the one that uh, eats pork, drinks alcohol, smokes tobacco, dresses immodestly, and uh, watches Hollywood movies and so forth. And, and the Christian would say, I mean, the Adventist would say, well, if that's what you understand Christian to mean, I'm not a Christian. And, and then they'd say, well, what are you? And they'd say, I'm an Adventist. And then he would say, and, 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 and they'd say, what is an Adventist? And he'd say, well, an Adventist is one who believes in the words of the prophets and seeks to follow them carefully, uh, doesn't eat any unclean meat, doesn't smoke, drink, or dress immodestly, et cetera, et cetera. And they'd say, oh, you're a Muslim. <laughs> and so in attempting to get close to people, we emphasize what we have in common with them. And if you're, if you're trying to get close to a Catholic, you don't start out by saying, you're dead wrong about the Trinity. <laughs> because the fact of the matter is that most Catholic lay people don't have anything, don't have any knowledge of the medieval view of the Trinity. <laughs> so, so what you mean by language is very important. But here's the thing. Ellen White rejected three, at least three main philosophical aspects of the traditional Trinity doctrine. And uh, here's a statement where she says, those who suppose they understand philosophy think their explanations are necessary to unlock the treasures of knowledge and prevent heresies from coming into the church. But it is these explanations that have brought in false theories and heresies. And uh, so here are three ways that her view of the heavenly trio and she does use the word trio, which is um, a simpler uh, equivalent of trinity. Um, how her view differs from the traditional doctrine. She rejected at least three of the philosophical presuppositions of the traditional doctrine. 
First, she rejected the radical dualism of spirit or soul and body. The view that God is pure soul and totally transcendent, completely separated from things of time and space. It's thought that God cannot act within human history because he is, he is completely other, except through the soul, that one bit of divinity present in humans. A second philosophical presupposition that she rejected is timelessness, that God exists in an eternal now without past or future. And this leads to the ideas of eternal generation and eternal procession. And uh, if you have any opportunity to take classes from, uh, from John Peckham um, or read some of the stuff of Fernando Canale, um, there, I wouldn't say it's essential to personal faith, but I would say that it unlocks huge issues in terms of how we relate to traditional Christianity. A third presupposition that she rejected was impassibility, the, uh, that God is impassable. And this comes from the guy idea that God is ultimate perfection. So if he's ultimate perfection, then he can't change. And if he can't change, then he can't be affected by other things external to himself. So impassibility teaches that God is free from all emotion, that God is not affected by, by, by what we think of him or, or how we respond to him or don't respond to him. Um, Aristotle taught that for him to even think of sinful humans would spoil his perfection. But scripture tells us very clearly, Isaiah 53, 4 and 6, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Well, that's what impassibility says, that he can't sympathize with our weaknesses. But was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. I mean, that is something that is totally outside Aristotle's purview. The idea that God could become flesh and be tempted. So Ellen White rejects these traditional presuppositions. Her biblical view of God sees God as active within time and space, genuinely involved in our lives, deeply caring about us. And so as we, as we go to scripture, we find that there is a biblical trinity doctrine. Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Genesis 2.24, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one. Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image. In John 17, 22, Jesus prayed that they, the believers, may be one, just as Christ and the Father are one. So there is a oneness among believers. There is a oneness um, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, although they are one in a deeper sense than we are um, because... Uh, They are God, and we are not. And they are sinless, and we are not. And they are infinite, and we are not. Here's what Ellen White wrote about uh, John 17, 20 to 22. The personality of the Father and the Son, also the unity that exists between them, are presented in the 17th chapter of John in the prayer of Christ for his disciples. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. So she, she, talks, she uses this text as, as clear evidence for the separate personalities of the persons of the Godhead, but the one God that exists in perfect unity. Um, so the unity that exists between Christ and his disciples does not destroy the personality of either. This is continuing the previous slide. They are one in purpose, in mind, in character, but not in person. It is thus that God and Christ are one. So this passage is a very clear statement as to how Ellen White understands the oneness of God in three persons. Now God's relational oneness does not rule out his ontological oneness. Ellen White's emphasis on the relational unity of God, that they may be one as we are one, um, does not preclude 
a unity of being and substance. And both Canale and Fritz Guy have warned against the danger of tritheism. If we, if we emphasize the relational unity to the exclusion of the ontological unity. Um, so, um, Fernando Canale writes that the danger of tritheism involved in this position becomes real when the oneness of God is reduced to a mere unity conceived in analogy to a human society or fellowship of action. Beyond such a unity of action, however, it's necessary to envision God as the one single reality which in the very acts by which he reveals himself directly in history transcends the limits of our human reason. But God's ontological unity must be accepted by faith. In other words, we can say that this is necessary. But he goes on to say, in no way could human minds achieve what the classic doctrine about the Trinity claims to perceive, namely the description of the inner structure of God's being. Together with the entire creation, we must accept God's oneness by faith. We cannot enter into the intimacy, the, uh, the unity between Christ and the Father and the Spirit. We must simply accept it by faith. Okay, um, I guess that's it. Um, the, the PowerPoint closes with some outlines here of the, of the book about the Trinity and where you might look for more information for some of these things. I've also uh, given some handouts to the secretary to be posted online, which uh, should be available to you also. If they're not there now, it should be very shortly. Okay, let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for your generosity to us, for the great love that motivated you to send Jesus as our sacrifice and savior and the Holy Spirit to draw us to Jesus. We thank you for all that you are doing in our behalf. And we pray that as we daily form a closer connection with you and a closer understanding of you, that we will be able to cooperate with you more fully and that you will be able to express your wills through us and be glorified through us. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.